come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. From time to time, we come across a story so unexplainable, so incredible, that we just cannot pass it by. So today, no mystery to challenge your powers of deduction, for there is no rational explanation of what happened. However, if you care to accompany me into the land of the uncharted and unknown, I think it will be well worth your while. Certain things that occur have no explanation, but that makes them no less worthy of repeating on Mystery Theater. Our mystery drama, Second Sight, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by James Agate Jr. and stars Michael Tolan. I'll be back shortly with Act One. put you in a receptive frame of mind for today's mystery theater, let me ask you this. Suppose you looked into the mirror, but didn't see your own reflection. Or suppose you opened a newspaper, and there was your own obituary. Or suppose you saw in a flash something that had not yet happened. Would you feel you were responsible if the following day it did come to pass? And it was a murder? Questions like these are not answered easily, if at all, by scientist, doctor, or psychiatrist. Certainly not by Dr. Marvin Kingsley. Dr. Kingsley, it's good of you to see me on such short notice. Well, I'm happy to work with your Air Pilots Association. Your full name, please. Alan Harvey. And you're an airline pilot, correct? I was an airline pilot, but you don't have to say any more. I'm aware of your problem. But I want to say more. If you're going to help me, Dr. Kingsley, I've got to tell you everything as I see it, not as my airline sees it. Go ahead. I've been on international flights for ten years. I've flown around the world I don't know how many times. I'm a million-mile pilot several times over. And then, one day on my flight to the Caribbean, it happened. I'll never forget it. We were making good time, in spite of headwinds and visibility zero. Are you still on automatic, Alan? What'd you say, Charlie? I said, are Charlie, you still... look out there. Do you see what I see? No. Nothing. No, that object flying across at three o'clock. Come on, Alan. There's nothing out there. Check the scope, will you? Nothing. Nothing's on the scope. Not a blip? Not a blip. It's gone. Alan, are you all right? Of course I'm all right. I don't know. You're seeing things I don't see. That was the first time, Dr. Kingsley. You thought you saw an object in the sky? I didn't think I saw it. I know I saw it. Uh, during the month of September, you reported sighting various objects in mid-flight, which made no impression on the electronic monitoring gear. That's why I was grounded. I was just as glad. You know, Doctor, you can take just so much kidding about seeing unidentifiable flying objects. The UFOs? I never saw any UFOs. I saw men in the sky, standing upright, holding flags. National colors, which I couldn't identify. I saw mountaintops with cows grazing on them. A skyscraper a hundred stories high in black marble. I saw... I saw too much. What do you think, Doctor? Well, what you saw in the skies is obviously very real to you. Now, for starters, I'm going to recommend a complete rest. But I mean complete rest. I'll go crazy doing nothing. Oh, I neglected to ask you, Alan. Are you married? No, I'm not. I was once, but that was a long time ago. I live by myself. Here in Greenfield? Right on North Chatham Street. Oh, I'm not suggesting you just sit and vegetate. Do you have any hobbies or uh, interests other than your job? <sighs> well, let me see. Years ago, I was interested in becoming a painter. Even now, I've sort of kept up. Sometimes I'll... I'll take a sketch pad and draw. Oh, good. Uh, what kind of things? Lately, I've been drawing the objects I've observed from the cockpit. Well, why not enroll in some art class? That would occupy you, challenge you. You know, the university I teach at has a very fine art department. Would that appeal to you? What good would it do me? I'm a flyer. I'm never going to make it as an artist. Well, it would give you another outlet for your energies. 
Let me put in a call to Jacob Greer, who runs the department. He teaches a few classes also. See, I know Jacob personally, and I'm sure he'd take you in. I don't know. How, how long should I do it? Well, let's not set any limits for the present. See, there's one thing you need more than anything else, and perhaps drawing in a class with other people will help you achieve it. What one thing? What do I need? Peace of mind, Alan. I'm happy to meet you, Mr. Harvey. I'm Jacob Greer. Marvin Kingsley tells me you'd like to join one of our art classes. Have you ever drawn a live model before? No, I haven't, Mr. Greer. I, I've brought along the kind of sketches I've done, mostly in my spare time, you understand. Uh-huh. Well, extraordinary. Most imaginative. Uh, these people standing about in the clouds... Oh, it's very imaginative. Most of what I do is what I've seen. You have a good feeling for... I hope this wasn't drawn from life. What is it? It looks like the fuselage of a big airliner with a lot of bodies strewn about. Yes, that's what it is. I, I did that one yesterday. That's gruesome. Well, I think you have some talent, and if you'd like to join our class, it's Tuesdays and Fridays from 1 o'clock until 4 in this studio. I'd, I'd like to. Uh, let me uh, hang on to some of these drawings of yours, may I? Sure. This airplane crash, it's certainly powerful. Now, I'll be seeing Marvin Kingsley tonight. We have a running chess game on Monday evenings out for years. I'll tell him you're joining us. Checkmate, Marvin, old boy. <laughs> I saw it coming, Jacob. <laughs> you know, you're going to qualify as a grandmaster one of these days. Ah, you're off your game. I know you, Marv. Yeah. You're right, you're right. I wasn't concentrating. Marv, that fellow Alan Harvey you sent me, he's a strange sort of man, quite gifted. I've seen his portfolio. Have you uh, known him for long? Well, as a matter of fact, I haven't. See, he came to me because he was having some problems in, uh, in relaxing. Oh, I didn't ask you what his problem was. Uh, you know, I don't discuss my patients, Jacob. Let's say he may have some guilds, and I prescribed your art course as a vacation from those guilds. Well, I'll say this, he has a lot of talent. There was one drawing he showed me that... Hey, do you mind if I turn this up? I'd like to catch the evening news. No, no, I'll go make us some coffee. Oh, I forgot to get cream, darn it. Uh, don't worry, I can take it black. A jet airliner carrying 200 people crashed into a corporate plane at 6 o'clock tonight after traffic controllers radioed conflicting instructions. This is the scene behind me. One of the worst air disasters to strike this area in the history of aviation. According to... What is it? What happened? Oh, something with the TV set. They've still got the picture, but there's no sound. Do... Do you see that shot of the field? Wait. Well, it can't be. Good Lord. Hello. Oh, no. Turn it off if it upsets you. It's all those bodies. No, no, that's not what I mean. Turn it off. No, 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 they'll get the sound back in a minute. They, they still got the picture. Turn it off, please. Okay, okay. I want to show you something. Here. This is one of the drawings your Alan Harvey left with me. Mm -hmm. What do you see? Hmm. Grizzly, almost photographically detailed drawing of a smashed airliner. And smashed people. Well? Well, what are you trying to tell me, Jacob? Doesn't this drawing look exactly like what we just saw on the tube? But exactly? Uh, yes, I suppose there is a similarity. Oh, I forgot to tell you. You see, Alan Harvey was an airline pilot, so I suppose he drew that from some experience he had. Marvin, my mind deals in pictures. I would say there's not just a similarity... The real accident and what this man has drawn are identical. Oh, but how could they be? You said you saw him this morning. He couldn't have drawn it at the airport. It just happened at six o'clock tonight. He said he did it yesterday. 
Well, I'll bet if you went through the files and matched the photographs, there's a sameness about most air crashes. Mm, I hope you're right. I don't understand why you're so upset, Jacob. What else could it be? It got me to thinking, that's all. Well, what's your problem? If Alan Harvey can draw a future occurrence before it happens, I'd say we all have a problem. We welcome today a new member to our life class, Alan Harvey. Uh, Miss Johnson, we'll have two minutes of warm-up poses, and then we'll begin the longer poses. Arthur, uh, why don't you put your easel beside Alan so that if there's anything he doesn't know, you can fill him in. All right, Miss Johnson. I'm uh, I'm new to this. W what are warm-up poses? Uh, you'll see. Those are the action poses Miss Johnson does up there. You know, poses that, that no model could hold very long. Uh, that one, see? One leg up and hand extended, sort of, uh, sort of like a dance pose. I'm supposed to draw that? W what's she doing? You certainly are, Alan. That's it. Use your charcoal. Fine. Good, good. Just a few action lines. Alan, that's very good. Contour is excellent. Well, what's oh, your... fine. I what like did he that. say your name was? Uh, Arthur Lewis. Excellent. I'm Alan Harvey. Say. Hey, you're not bad. That's good. How can she hold that pose, leaning over one hand way down and the other way up? Because Miss Johnson is a professional model, Alan. And I suppose we have less talk and more drawing, okay? Good. Yeah. Just a couple of contour lines, Alan. We're not projecting the model's complete form. Do you uh, mind if I stand behind you, Alan? Oh, no. <laughs> no, not at all, Professor Greer. Uh, wait a minute. Let me see that one you just turned over. Oh, it's nothing, really. I, I didn't even know what I was drawing. Alan, one of the things you've got to learn about our work, no one can afford to be shy or modest. Looking, appraising, it's the only way for me to gauge your progress. Well, it isn't anything. Let me be the judge of that. Now pull that page back. You just sketched this? It took me all of two minutes. I told you it wasn't any good. It's very good. It's just that uh, I'm a little taken aback at what you drew. Taken aback? Isn't that a drawing of our model, Miss Johnson? Lying across that bed, bruises on her neck, eyes staring open as if she'd just been strangled to death. I warned you, didn't I? This would be a story hard to explain. If you like, let's begin by believing some events are coincidence. Or, as the phrase goes, a strange coincidence. However, the model Miss Johnson isn't dead yet, and as we know, Alan Harvey's wings were clipped for seeing things that weren't there. Did I say foreseeing? Just a coincidence. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. Remember the old story of the three blind men who were asked to describe an elephant? One felt the big wide body and said, it's a wall of leather. The second put his arms around one of the animal's legs and said, it's the trunk of a tree. And the third blind man felt the elephant's tail and said, it's a snake. All were mistaken, for none could really see the elephant. Are we perhaps also limited in our vision? And what we think exists may not. Is Alan Harvey able to see what really is with a special second sight that is not ours? I'll be frank with you. It disturbed me to discover I'd been drawing our model, Miss Johnson, as a victim of a murder. I'd never given it a second look. The truth is I didn't even remember drawing it. Professor Greer kept looking at what I'd done with this horrified expression. So I was pretty shaken when I came back to class on Friday and set up my easel next to Arthur Lewis. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, today Miss Johnson will skip the warm-up poses. The pose she will now assume will be the one held for the entire session. 
20-minute poses in the first hour and a half with the usual five-minute rest periods. All right, any questions? Uh, yes, uh, Professor Greer. Miss Johnson? It's a little chilly in the studio this morning. Could I have a heater placed near me? Of course. Arthur, would you be good enough to get the electric heater out of my office? Can't afford to have our Miss Johnson catch cold. My progress that day was as halting as the first days had been speedy. I, I didn't know what to make of it. Miss Johnson was the model as before, but somehow I could not get her down on paper. For the first time since I'd begun the classes, I was relieved when Jacob Greer pointed to the clock. That'll be all for today. Class dismissed. Oh, uh, Alan, would you uh, stay on a bit? Yes, Professor Greer. I noticed you're having a little trouble today. Some of those lines are just not forceful enough. I was aware of that, too. Something seems to be holding me up now. May I have a look at what you've been doing? Of course. What? Is this all you've done today? I'm afraid so. I, I tried. I couldn't even get the simplest action line. Uh, what's that supposed to be? Where? In the corner of that page. A table set for two people at the... I know where that is. Yes, it is. That's the Chinese restaurant right here in town. <laughs> I hope by next Tuesday you'll be taking a more serious approach to your work. I am serious, Professor Greer. I just don't seem to be able to concentrate on what I see. What's in my mind's eye is so much clearer to me than what's in front of my real eye. I can't think how you happen to know I just love Chinese food. I just guessed, Miss Johnson. I wasn't doing anything particular this evening, so I took a chance you might be free. It so happens this is my one night off in the week. You mean you've got a regular job as well as modeling? Well, I just model for extra money. I'm studying piano at the music school. You're a musician? Well, I hope to be. Every day but today and Sundays, I go to class from 4 to 7. Then I have a little supper at my place and then back to the school where they let me practice as late as I like. That's quite a schedule. Is, uh, is painting all you do, Mr. Harvey? Right now it is, Miss Johnson. <laughs> What's your first name? Peggy. Mine's Alan. It's a funny thing, but I I don't associate the girl who stands up in class and poses uh, with you. <laughs> well, I'm a little more formally dressed now. <laughs> you're, you're not married, are you? I was a long time ago, but my wife didn't like my being married to an airline. I'm a pilot. I don't believe it. I was married to a pilot, too. Oh, but it didn't take. Take? Take us long to discover it was a big mistake. I'm sorry. I'm not. Anyway, seeing Jacob is much better. No strings and outside of the classroom. He's he's very amusing. Jacob? You're, you're dating Professor Greer? Yes. Well, is that so crazy? There's not that much difference in our ages. No, I'm not saying there is. It's just so uh, <laughs> unexpected. Oh, I see younger men, too. Like Arthur. Arthur Lewis, who sits next to you in class. We with the red beard? Yeah, sure, sure, I know. He's awfully nice, too. Not nearly as possessive. In fact, in many ways, I think he's more mature than Jacob. Say, aren't you getting hungry? Oh, famished. I tell you what. You order from column A, and I'll order from column B. Ladies and gentlemen, it seems our Miss Johnson isn't going to be with us today. And Arthur has volunteered to model for us, so we shan't be losing any time. You all ready, Arthur? Uh, ready when you are, J.G. All right, please begin. Now, I want you all to loosely suggest the action of the pose before you actually sketch the form. <laughs> Very good, Alan. <laughs> you don't seem to have any block when it comes to drawing the male form. <laughs> it was only that one time, Professor Greer. I'm, I'm sure I could do Miss Johnson next time. Keep drawing. Good. Uh, what are you doing now? Putting in a face. Well, that's not Arthur's face. It's more like mine. And, Alan, what's that you're drawing in the subject's right hand? Right hand? I, I don't know. I wish you'd stick to what's before you and not try to dramatize things as though you were doing an illustration for a mystery magazine. You've got me holding a pistol. Now I see a doorway and some other body crumpled up against it as though... 
He'd just been shot. Dr. Kingsley, I really appreciate you seeing me on a Sunday. What I want to say is... How can I say it? I I don't think these life classes are doing me any good. Well, why do you say that, Alan? I went nearly crazy yesterday, Saturday. I, I tried to get out of the house, take a walk, but I... I found myself always coming back to my drawing board. Well, I think that's a good sign. But it's not. Nothing's changed. It's it's all as it was before. I, I'm seeing things that nobody else sees, only now I'm drawing them. Here, look at these, please. Some I've done in class and, and, and some at home. Hmm. Yes, I see what you mean. Do you? Do you really? I, I'm terrified. Oh, you, you draw very well, Alan. It's what I draw. Here, this... This one, for instance. Now, now look, you, you will work your way out of this. Um, don't worry. It's the mind's way of healing itself. Doctor, I think you've got it all wrong. Here, look here. I, I drew this just this morning before I came to see you. I, I sat myself down and this happened, like, like automatic writing. Well, the drawings are for Jacob Greer to criticize. Now, what do you expect from me? Just, just tell me what you see. All right. It's a young man, about uh, 25, I'd say, stretched out off a slab in the morgue. Uh, when were you at the morgue last? Never. I've never been there. But, well, you've seen pictures. I tell you, I haven't. But you must have. And you've forgotten. That happens to be the morgue attached to our hospital, exactly the way you've colored it. You don't understand. You simply do not understand, do you, doctor? I don't know what... Or how I draw. Uh, my, my dear Alan, you must have been there. The detail, the glare of that green shade, the hexagonal tiles, uh, that one broken tile near the door. Now, now face reality, Alan. Forget it. Do you know the young man you've drawn? That corpse with the red beard? That's the horrible part. Yes, I, I know him. His name is Arthur Lewis. He's another student in my class. What, what shall I do? Uh, when do you go again? Uh, to your art class? Day after tomorrow. All right. Now, right after class, come back here to my office and bring what you've drawn that day, and we will try again. Now, we'll sit down quietly, calmly, and talk about it. Uh, this sort of thing happens more often than not, Alan. We transfer and transpose people we know into the most unlikely situations. See, most of us do it in dreams, but you're doing it on paper. You you don't think it's any more than that, Dr. Kingsley? Just bear in mind, Alan, you and I are mortal. We can do no more, see no more, know no more than our five senses tell us. You mean there's no such thing as a sixth sense or a second sight? Well, arithmetically, perhaps. But in fact, no. Marvin. Well, come in. Come in. What are you doing here in the afternoon? You haven't stopped in to see me on a Sunday for I don't know how long. Well, I hope this isn't a bad time for you, Jake. No, no, not at all. Only if I'd known, I... Well, you see, I have a standing date with a young lady Sunday evenings, but, well, that gives us an hour. Yes, well, I'll, I'll, I'll get right to the point. That young pilot I sent over to you, Alan Harvey, well, he came to see me today and he brought some sketches. Oh, macabre, aren't they? But Splendid. He has a flair. As well, he's done it again. Well, at least I hope he hasn't. What has he done? It seems he's drawn one of your students, a chap with a red beard, lying on a slab in the morgue. Then he showed me another he'd done of a girl, your life model, strangled. He's also drawn me, holding a pistol. Claims he doesn't know what he's doing, has no control. I've put it down to wild imagination. Well... I've also told him it was ridiculous to attach any significance to it. Well, I certainly won't. The very young lady he strangled on paper, I've been seeing quite a lot of for almost three months now. I'm taking her to dinner tonight. You're not serious. Oh, I am, Marv. Very serious. I know she's been seeing a younger man, but I don't know who he is. But so what? Jacob Greer, you... I just <laughs> may ask Peggy to marry me. What? Imagine keeping this from me. I really didn't <laughs> feel that serious about Peggy until, I don't know, it just grew on me. <laughs> well, congratulations. <laughs> I, I, I'd better go. It, it was only about Alan that I dropped in. 
You know, one of these days I'll figure out why he is so preoccupied with death. But I'll give it a thought, Jacob. I'll keep tabs on him. So will I. I'm very interested in that young man. He has an enormous talent. Alan, I feel so wicked. I can't begin to tell you. Why, Peggy? Half of America goes to the movies on a Sunday night and has a soda afterwards. Oh, it's not that I'm having a soda in a drugstore at ten at night with a man I've only known for a few days. It's because I've stood up the two guys I usually date. Who, Jacob? And Arthur. I generally see Jacob for dinner Sunday nights. He gets me home about this time, and then half an hour later, Arthur stops by, and we go listen to music somewhere. <laughs> You're going to get yourself into trouble. They enjoy themselves. So why did you go out with me? Because I love going to movies, and nobody ever asks me. Well, you'd better beat it home. At least you can keep one of your two dates. <laughs> That's our weather for tonight. Here now is the Midnight News. We have just received word of a triple tragedy on the north side, involving a young music student who had been doing part-time modeling, a young man who is an art student, and an art teacher. All are dead in what appears to be a double murder and suicide. For a report from the scene of the tragedy, here now is... Oh, my Lord, I can't be hearing this. It can't be true. Did Alan Harvey unconsciously set into motion these extraordinary events, or is he cursed with second sight? More often than not, when our second act curtain rings down on Mystery Theater, all of the clues are in, all the evidence presented, and you have an equal chance to solve the mystery. Not this time, for we appear to be dealing in an enigma wrapped in a secret contained in a sealed book written about a strange, uncharted land. Come back with your compass when I return shortly with Act Three. Until I began to host Mystery Theater, I thought of myself as pretty realistic. I believed what I saw and drew conclusions from known facts. Well, I've come quite a ways since then, and now I suspect there's an awful lot to be said for the unknown. What we thought was impossible yesterday is possible today. Couldn't the same be true of tomorrow? In our world, anything can happen and probably will. It's that same evening... Fearfully, Dr. Marvin Kingsley keeps listening to the news. We repeat the first bulletin. Police are investigating three deaths on the north side in the apartment of a part-time model found strangled. Also dead, apparently shot, is a male art student and a male art teacher. The woman has been identified as Peggy Johnson and the young man as Arthur Lewis. The police have not yet released the name of the art teacher other than to say... It can't be. It can't be. Not him. Oh, Jacob, please. Be home. Oh, please, please, answer the phone. Please. Please. Today is Monday. I feel peculiar. I keep trying not to think of tomorrow in another life class. I sit at my table and look out the window. All the little houses. Ours is not a big town. All the capitals of the world I've flown to. Rome, Paris, Amsterdam, London. It, it all seems like another lifetime. I look down at my drawing pad. I've drawn a heavy set man standing in a courtroom before a judge. I better call Dr. Kingsley right away. Alan. Alan, I'm glad to hear your voice. I've done another one of those mysterious drawings. Have you sketched someone you know? Not this time. Someone I've never seen before, I know that. A big hulk of a man standing in front of a judge. From the look I've drawn on the man's face and the look on the judge's, I'd say the judge was about to pass a sentence of death. Uh, I'll tell you what you do, Alan. 
Why don't you walk over here? It'll take you no more than three quarters of an hour, and uh, by the time you get here, I will have cleared the decks. Bring that drawing of yours, Alan, and we'll talk. I've lived in Greenfield all my life. Every time I'd come back from some round trips for my week off, I'd find the town pretty much the same. So why I got confused going across town to Dr. Kingsley's, I can't imagine. But I did. Turned up the wrong street, and before I knew it, I was lost. So I cut through an unfamiliar alley, and there it was. A fence about nine feet high. I couldn't see over it. Over the gate was written J. Murty, Tombstones, Monuments. I opened the gate and looked inside. A yard full of gravestones. Come on in, young fellow. Don't stand out there. Oh, thanks. May I? I'm glad to see you. You're very expert chipping words into that stone. Marble. I also do granite. This is quite a large place you've got here. I bet you keep busy. Well, the word gets kind of lonely. Not many people like to be around gravestones. Makes them think. Oh, let me introduce myself. Julian Merte. Oh, yes, I saw your sign. I, I'm Alan Harvey. You looking for someone? I'll tell you the truth, I turned down the wrong street. D did you say your name was Merte? Yes. Why, do you know me from somewhere? I don't know. M Mr. Merte, have we, have we ever met before? Mm, I don't think so. Of course, I have seen a lot of people in my day. Why? You think we have met? Well, everything about you, I... I don't know how to say it. It's... It, it's uncanny. Hey, look at this, will you? A, a drawing I did today. Ah, that is quite good. You did that? This morning. I have always admired the man who could sit down and draw straight off like that. Now, uh, why did you want me to see this, Mr. Harvey? The man in the drawing, it, it just came to me. He looks just like you, Mr. Murty. Oh, that man there standing in front of the judge looks like me, you say? Ah. Oh, I saw he does, Mr. Harvey. So he does. Julian? Julian, where are you? Here, my dear. Oh, you have company. Uh, Mr. Harvey, Mrs. Merte, my wife. Oh, please. Uh, did you? Uh, Mr. Harvey is an artist, Mary. Uh, Julian, go along and wash your hands. It'll be time for supper shortly. Supper? I had no idea it was that late. I... I must be going. Ah, no, sir. Please don't go. I've got something to show you. Or perhaps some other time. I I'll come back. No, no, it wouldn't take long. Five minutes, I promise you. Just five. <laughs> All right. Certainly. I'll be right back. Young man, I don't know who you are, but I advise you to leave right now. There's a storm coming up. I should go. I'm late as it is. Someone's expecting me. Then go. I'll explain to my husband. But he seems so anxious to show me something. It's only those gravestones. He's so proud of them. But they won't run away. I advise you, young man, for the sake of your well-being and health, leave now. My health? And your peace of mind. Does the name Julian Murty mean anything to you? Julian Mur... Yes. Yes, I have heard that name. Arizona? No, no, California, the Rock Bridge. And the Wyoming Stone Faces. I is your husband that Julian Murty? Yes. Well, he's one of the great sculptors. What? What's he doing in this back alley making gravestones? He fell out of fashion. It's as simple as that. But, it but... He broke his heart. He has never been the same. You mean no one commissions his works anymore? For 20 years, no one. And that isn't the worst of it. You had better go. Well, can't you tell me why I should go? Because sometimes he is not responsible. Not anymore. All washed, all clean. Oh, say, we are in for a storm, Mary. I am taking Mr. Harvey into the studio. Well, if you'll excuse me, I'd better go right away. What? In all this rain, you will get soaked. Come along, follow me. Let's run for it. This is quite a place. 
I've never seen so many different kinds of gravestones. Yeah, these are mostly samples to show people what they can have to commemorate their loved ones. I like to keep my epitaphs light-hearted. You do? On a gravestone? Yeah, what better place? After all, death is the ultimate joke, isn't it? I never thought about it that way. Well, you think about it. Think about it. This headstone here is the tallest I have done. It may be more to your liking. It's a sample which I completed only this morning. He flew high. He flew low. Now to heaven may his spirit go. Alan Harvey, requiescat in pace. That's... That's my name. This is what I wanted to show you. My name? Well, you must believe me, Mr. Harvey. Pure coincidence. I don't know where the name come from. Just uh, entered my head. But the date's under my name. The first one is exactly when I was born. Really? A further coincidence. And the date of death? Today. Well, I was just making it topical. You go right ahead, Mr. Harvey, and use the telephone. Uh, supper will be on the table in a moment. Oh, thank you. I had this appointment, and I... I just better call... Uh, hello, Dr. Kingsley. Uh, this is Alan Harvey. Oh, yes, yes, I, I was wondering what happened to you. I, uh, I got lost, believe it or not, and, and then it started to storm, so I'm staying with some people I met. Uh, I can't quite hear you, Alan. Can you speak louder? Uh, no, no, I can't. This man insisted I stay for supper. Uh, are you all right, Alan? Alan? I hear you. Yes, I'm all right. I'll, I'll try and come by later, Dr. Kingsley. Goodbye. You know, I told you, Harvey, I don't get many visitors, especially people from the world of art. And that is why, after supper, I asked you back here in my studio. Mary, uh, Mrs. Mert, uh, funny thing, but uh, she is not that interested in art. I really ought to be on my way. Ah, nonsense. I wouldn't hear of it. You know, when it rains like this and I can't go outside and work on the new stones, I'll spend an evening sharpening my chisels. And you see, I've got my grinding stone here. I put my foot on the treadle, give it a twist, and there she goes. Ah. A lot of these chisels are due for sharpening. If you will look under that table where you are sitting, Mr. Harvey, you will find some drawing paper. There are pencils and charcoal in a little box down there. Go help yourself. I know what it is like to have thoughts and ideas just screaming to be put on paper. It's a compulsion. I wonder what time it is. <laughs> Later than it was, but one always hopes not too late. Ah, I see you have begun to draw. Mr. Harvey, I cannot tell you what a pleasure it is to meet you at last. You were right about compulsion. I wish I could leave. Oh, I'm not keeping you. No, not you, Mr. Murthy. What I'm sketching. The pencil, it... It won't stop. My hand has to keep following it. Ah, you have that problem, too. It's a shame that all your great works are now only tombstones. Great works. <laughs> I was great once. And now nothing but a letterer and a numberer in stone. I wish you had not said that, Mr. Harvey. You are like all the rest. Yeah. This is the sharpest I have ever honed a chisel. Do you know that, Mr. Harvey? Hmm? We're all failures. 
That is why we die. I wish you would not keep saying that, Mr. Harvey. I am still sketching at this table. And Julian Merte keeps turning his grindstone. All I can hear is the whirring and buzzing of the wheel and the drumming of the rain. The air is close in the studio. I'm rooted to this chair, to what I'm drawing. It's almost finished now. I can see out of the corner of my eye Julian Merte sharpening his chisels and watching me. He's staring at me. Staring. They found the sketch Alan Harvey was making. It depicted the supreme moment of agony, the final gasp of a man in the last throes of life. The figure in his picture lay sprawled across a table where it had been drawn on a sheet of paper. On that sheet of paper was a sketch of still another man, identical. Then another picture within a picture. Each successive figure had been stabbed in the back with a long bladed chisel embedded to the hilt. Killed exactly the way they found Alan Harvey himself. I'll return in a moment. We accept certain rules of existence on our planet. The pull of gravity, the rising sun and moon, that rain is wet and snow is cold. We feel wind, which we cannot see. You accept the sound of my voice, although you know I'm speaking from miles away. We accept from experience and habit. But there are other facts of life and death for which we have no explanation. Yet, can we disregard them? They, too, must be faced, and perhaps you, too, will experience them. All you need is a little second sight. Our cast included Michael Tolan, Joan Shea, Robert Dryden, and Earl Hammond. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.